All right. Welcome back. You know, I miss the uh, in-person because I usually do a lot of changes, so I have to change my outfit. <laughs> Just pretending that we're live. I really miss all of you guys, and it's so good to see you, Steve, um, Simon. Um, I guess all that's good. So the next um, panel um, is about home ownership and small business and LA Reach. So welcome back. We're about to begin our second dialogue with Mr. Dennis Santiago, and he's the moderator. Dennis uh, is a published author and commentator on national policy and global stability. He's a subject matter expert on bank risk and financial analysis. He's the co-chair of the advisory board of the National Diversity Coalition and currently serves as the chief operating officer of Barl Shield. He holds an MBA from UCLA and BSEE from UC Irvine. Uh, Dennis, I really want to thank you personally for helping us a lot and being serving an advisory board. So I'm going to take it away. Um, this is um, going to be translated in uh, Chinese um, and some Spanish. Uh, this is being recorded. So if you guys can talk a little bit slowly, that would be good. Thank you all. Thank you, Faith. And um, um, yeah, yeah, so um, my, here's the in interesting thing coming from the, the last uh, thing. So uh, uh, Yelena McWilliams did not hire me to be the director of innovation over at the FDIC. So naturally Faith Bautista found me and put me to work anyway. So here we are. Um, today for this session, we are going to be talking about uh, a, a very special project, I think, that the Americans should should be much more aware of, something called Project Reach, and it is uh, the the brain the, the 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 brainchild of another federal regulator, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, uh, which uh, sits alongside the FDIC and the Federal Reserve in the regulation of the U.S. banking industry, and. Project Reach back in, in the middle of COVID in, in July of 2020 started this project to begin to look at the needs of um, small business, home ownership access, uh, the re revitalization of uh, minority deposit uh, in, depository institutions and other aspects of the, how you make banking work better for ordinary people. And uh, so we're going to go through and hear from uh, uh, various uh, panelists today who have been working in these areas. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to let them uh, do their own little intros as they come on board. But we're going to start with uh, the, um, the uh, federal regulator um, uh, that, that is behind Project REACH. And I uh, will, will give the floor uh, to Bill Haas, who I am uh, uh, just blessed to have met and, and begun to work with as part of the Project REACH in the Los Angeles REACH portion, which focuses on uh, the California uh, part of the world. Um, and have, uh, I think it's important to understand who is Project REACH, what, is it, what does it do, uh, what is LA in, in the context of, of that, what challenges is, is, are the working groups trying to solve, and what committees and subcommittees have been activated, and uh, uh, and uh, you know where the progress is on on where we are going, because we are um, uh, as groups are coming together, and this includes banks, uh, NGOs, um, 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 uh, technical institution, uh, te technical services companies, and and other infrastructure, trying to work together. That we are cognizant of the fact that we are sitting on a ticking time bomb of uh, the end of uh, things like forbearance and COVID. And, um, and there, there is a race on to um, do some good uh, before uh, we potentially trigger another six systemic risk point in the economy. And I can assure you that a lot of people are working very hard. And, and, and so without further ado, Mr. Bill Haas, the uh, uh, floor is yours. Dennis, th th thank you. Th thank you so much. And uh, Really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about Project Reach, and I'm glad that we have 75 minutes for this panel because that's just about how long it takes to talk about all the exciting things that are going on with this with with this project. But um, today we will find the 10-minute version of, of, of Project Reach. So 
just want to start a little bit with the kind of the genesis of the project. Uh, the, 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 the brainchild of, of this project is actually going to moderate the, the final panel of the day, uh, Acting Controller Brian Brooks. So, um, you know, we're all, we're all thankful to him for his vision and leadership to really make this, uh, the, the, this vision a, a reality. So um, let me start there, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at the national level and focus on what we're doing at, at the LA level as well. So, you know, if you think back just a, a number of, of months ago, we all witnessed the, the, the troubling events last spring and summer culminating with the death of George Floyd. And as a result of that, in you know, the widespread civil unrest and protesting, um, now, neither, sadly, neither social unrest nor the inconsistent treatment of minorities are new events. And as others have already reflected their, 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 their sentiments, you know, tragically, we continue to witness heinous acts of violence uh, against, against targeted co communities. And uh, for the most recent events, you know, our hearts break uh, for the impact of families and the communities and, and hope that a, a sense of, of, of peace and uh, you know, mutual respect can, can come sooner than, than later. But as, as we think kind of longer term, for far too long, far too many people have been, have been unable to fully participate in the financial system, right? While many have flourished and, and accumulated wealth, many have gone underserved or completely left out of, of the financial system. And wealth gaps that existed 20 to 30 years ago continue to today with a little progress. And, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's a truly unacceptable. And, this is kind of an opportunity and the perfect time to really try to try to change some of these embedded uh, barriers that have existed for a very long time. But I think too, and, and this is the comments from, from, from Brian Brooks, that was, was that the, the events of last summer were the reaction to, to, to these tragic events were, were different. And it prompted many, many people to reflect on, on why did this was. And I think it was in particular the death of George Floyd that, that prompted Brian Brooks is our acting controller to himself kind of reassess the circumstances. And he came, he came to this conclusion that, that the unrest and protests were not a reaction simply to these, these one or a few single tragic events, but rather it was the result of pinup frustration accumulated over the course of time about the entrenched structural barriers that impede people from being able to fully participate in the financial act system and to have uh, their fair access to the flow of capital, et cetera. So that is the genesis of a project REAP. At the, at the highest level, REAP is all about uh, identifying and seeking to reduce or eliminate barriers to fair and full economic participation and to expand access to credit and capital for those underserved and minority populations and to give them an equal opportunity to accumulate wealth, start businesses, et cetera, which all we know is critical to to, 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 to job creation across the country. So one, one thing that's really unique about Project Reach is that, you know, we of course have our supervisory powers and, and we can leverage them to, uh, to instruct institutions what to do and, and, and when to do it. Project Reach is really about leveraging our convening powers uh, to bring together a various and variety of diverse uh, entities across the whole spectrum of, of uh, um, corporate America to, uh, to, to, to represent and work together towards solutions, but also to bring together um, uh, national civil rights organizations, local community uh, minded groups, et cetera. Uh, you think about Operation Hope, NCRC, et cetera. And of course, I, I, I wanna absolutely thank and, and point out that both Faith uh, and, and Jen Sung who are, who are participating in the meeting today are both founding members of Project REACH from, from, from inception and continue to, to contribute actively um, and daily uh, to, to, to the REACH initiatives. So let me briefly talk about what's happening at the, at the national level first. So we have four main priorities at the national level. One is, um, so as you heard before, the talk around the, the numbers of, of people in America, families in America who have no credit score or who have an incomplete credit score in our so-called credit invisibles. So because of this, we're focusing on bringing together a, a coalition of, of entities, banks, uh, fintechs, other organizations to, uh, to, to build a alternative credit scoring utility that will consider uh, alternative data that doesn't normally feed into a, a credit score such as 
utility payments or rent payments, et cetera, that will really help to identify more people who should and may in the future have access into the um, traditional banking system and, and thus uh, access to more affordable uh, credit products and services. Um, Affordable home ownership is, is, is a second group. And you'll, you'll see as we, as we rattle these off that we're not doing anything that's easy uh, in, in Project REACH. The, these are ambitious and impactful goals. Uh, so some of the projects are leveraging age old problems and leveraging existing technologies, but trying to approach the, the challenges in, in unique and innovative new ways to find solutions. So with affordable home ownership, we know the wealth gap between white and minority households is stark. It's been persistent. The average black family possesses roughly 15% of the wealth uh, of, of the average uh, white family. And most of this can be attributed back to the disparity in home ownership as, as home equity accumulation is one of the key sources of, of equity for, for most people. So we have working groups focusing on expanding down payment and closing cost programs, um, innovative tools to bring assist, uh, additional down payment assistance to prospective homeowners, uh, counseling and education, Etc. cetera, um, small business opportunities. So we, we know too that plenty of statistics are out there to show the disparities of, of capital access to minorities and to women-owned businesses, et cetera, that um, of uh, a couple of years back, right? Data that showed that, that um, the typical Caucasian family has access to over $100,000 of a potential savings to start a business. Uh, the minority family has less than $10,000, but yet just 2% of startup investment capital uh, had gone to women and less than 1% to uh, business owners of color, people of color. So it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword there that we need to, uh, need to resolve. So we have groups focusing on ways to bring additional credit uh, access to, to small business entrepreneurs, looking at ways to provide resources and new opportunities that they may not be aware of, uh, supplier diversity opportunities. We'll touch more on that here in a minute too. We also have a group at the national level focused on MDI revitalization. And we're doing some, so some really interesting things at the national level, a couple of them that it's, it's really too early to, to talk about in detail um, and it's too early to call success. But if these programs come together and hit the mark as we hope they will, they can be an absolute game changer uh, for, 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 for the industry going forward. Another thing we've done at the national level is to launch what we call the pledge to strengthen MDIs. So to date, 21 larger institutions have adopted the pledge and we're seeing an increasing number of participations uh, in, in, in collaborations and partnerships between larger institutions and MDIs across a whole spectrum of, of things that will that will help MDIs um, better serve their communities to strengthen the talent base of, of MDIs, to strengthen their balance sheets, to think more about the future and, and what, what MDIs will need to look like in terms of product and services to stay relevant in the quickly evolving financial services industry. So that, that's, that, that, that's a lot at, at the national level already that, that are keeping us very busy. But from the start, we never really envisioned that the Project REACH would remain a national program. In fact, and this, this is what really drew me into Project REACH. For the last 15 years, I was the supervisor of what we call um, mid-sized banks in, in, in the country and, and oversaw a team of uh, about 150 people. But every 15 years, it's time for a change. And this opportunity was too great to, to, uh, to, to pass up on. But one, one of the things that, that, that I have responsibility for with Project REACH is taking it on the road. And our first, our first road trip for Project Reach, if you will, was LA. So LA Reach, we launched in, in December, really got underway with a number of, of working groups in, in January. We'll gas up the, the Reach truck and find another location to, to, to launch uh, so some, some great work in other parts of the country here in the fairly near future as well. But in LA, we're, we're again, focusing on the same types of, of key High level initiatives. One, one is an, just an experiment to see how well these, these projects will, will, will travel uh, to, to, to local markets. Um, LA is a perfect microcosm of the broader national economy and a great place to, to, to test the launch as, as well. So at the, at, at the LA reach level, we have a working group focusing on home ownership issues. So again, we know, we, we know, about, the, we know about the wealth gaps. Um, we know about 
from hearing some of the discussions from, from the amazing group of smart minds that have come together in this, in this working group, just how, how, how stark some of the challenges are in terms of thinking about inventory availability of affordable homes, uh, to think about the, the cost of, of housing and ways to uh, leverage down payment assistance programs, et cetera. Uh, so well, one of the groups we have, and we can maybe talk more about this later is, is what we call the equity share options for down payment assistance and home retention. So this group is exploring innovative ways to, to bring new programs, to bring counseling services together with resources that will one, either, either provide additional resources for down payment for first time minority home buyers, but also as, as Dennis alluded to already, to, to try to minimize the, the, the brunt of of a potential wave of new foreclosures coming when forbearance programs come to an end uh, in, in the future. And uh, Dennis, heartfelt thanks to you for taking the lead on this on this working group um, focused on focused on uh, the, the, the these innovative equity share programs. So um, again, something that's that's it's really interesting and and can be hopefully very impactful. We also have another group uh, working on. Uh, in, expansion of single family inventories of affordable, affordable homes. So a number of, again, di different types of programs under consideration to repurpose Oreo properties, which are um, ba bank held uh, homes to look at, at uh, non-performing pre-foreclosure likely homes to intervene to get um, transfer into nonprofit organizations uh, and resources that will hopefully one, help preserve uh, home ownership for, 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 for many people, but also uh, when that's not possible to minimize the impact and to repurpose uh, inventories to people who are uh, seeking uh, home ownership for the first time. Uh, small business empowerment. We have, again, a number of, of really interesting projects going along here. Um, we know just how important st small business startups and growth of small businesses are in terms of job creation that the vast majority of new jobs come from creation and expansion of small businesses. So this is vital, not just to small business owners, but the overall uh, employment and job potential uh, in, in the future as well. So uh, really important that we hit the mark here. So we have, a, we have a group that's focusing on expanding awareness to and access to different sources of capital, but also coupling this with the technical assistance that will, that will help uh, small business owners be better prepared to source uh, new sources of, of capital, et cetera. We have a, a group that's working on supplier diversity, again, building awareness of the opportunities that small business owners have to, to, to plug into supplier diversity programs that, that large financial institutions and other corporations have. Uh, this, this group will, will, is actually in, in process of building a workshop that will, again, build the tools and, and the awareness and prepare small business owners to, uh, to, to be prepared for and to be certified to, to be suppliers for larger corporations. And then we have another group that's just coming together now that will focus on providing new opportunities and resources for women owned businesses as well and bringing the resources and the technical assistance that they need to, to build and grow their, their businesses as well. And, uh, look forward to hearing from Sal Enriquez and we'll just talk a little bit later because he is an active member of the small business working group, in particular, the supplier diversity initiative we have. And then lastly, uh, the revitalization of minority depository institutions. So we all know, too, that, that MDIs play a critical role in the communities that, that they serve. In many cases, it's, it's providing the bridge and the access to a trusted resource, particularly to people who may not have trust in, in the broader financial system. It's also the knowledge that MDIs have and the contacts that they have within their communities uh, to, to help address, address issues. So um, we, we really appreciate the work and the challenge that MDIs face in doing everything we can to make uh, their job a little bit easier and their future a little bit brighter. We have a couple of, of uh, groups here as well. One is focusing on building uh, and developing a variety of technical assistance venues that will provide the types of opportunities and resources for MDI executives to learn from subject matter experts in, in other parts of industry, larger banks, et cetera, um, other, other, other member groups, 
uh, but also to, to build and expand their own resource networks of people that they can reach out to for questions and guidance and, and new perspective. We also have a second group that's focused on what we call market strategies and products and services, which really will focus on you know, what, are the, what are the products and services that minority depository institutions will need to have in their, in their toolbox today and in the future, given the, past, the, the fast paced change and evolution of the, of, of the banking system uh, and increase in new competitors, uh, uh, change in demographic uh, um, patterns, et cetera, and really looking to you know, ways to ensure that, that MDIs have the products and services they need to stay relevant into the future and to continue to do their important work uh, down the road. So uh, and thanks to Simon for, for being uh, an active participant in our MDI uh, initiative. So, so just it's a, a lot of amazing things going on. Faith, I'm sorry I didn't follow your advice to talk slowly. Um, I, I, wish, I wish the best to your in, interpreter to to work through everything we have we have going with Project Reach, um, but I'm well, happy we'll to expand a little bit further as we work in through the course of the conversation. So, Dennis, thank you so much again for uh, um, the opportunity to be part of the panel, and to you, Faith, and Jen as well. Well, thank you, Bill, and uh, that that's certainly a mouthful that uh, will translate in uh, both English and and in other languages with uh, an equal amount of technical jargon that needs to be worked through. So I'm not really sure that speaking fast or slow is going to make any difference in the degree of difficulty. However, it's very, very clear that the uh, the project reach is into many things and it's trying to do many things at once. And, uh, and that involves bringing in a very large team of people. Um, next, we're going to turn to looking at the expansion of home ownership in the in the low to moderate income community. And we are fortunate today to have Steve Sugarman uh, join us because his company has recently completed a study on uh, the subject of low to moderate income uh, uh, conditions and access in 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 the community. And uh, we're fortunate here today to have him um, help explain some of the, uh, the, the, the things that they found, what they're up to, and, and really add to the knowledge base of, of, of the community looking at things. So Steve, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours, sir. Hey, thanks a lot, Dennis. Uh, it's, great to, it's great to be here, um, and it's great to follow uh, Bill and, and the OCC with their Project REACH plan. You know, we've been uh, trying to think through how to expand home ownership and uh, low and moderate income communities uh, so that there's more ownership and more capital that stays within these communities to uh, increase um, uh, wealth, household wealth, and decrease some of the uh, inequities that exist across the country right now. Uh, what we partnered with a CDFI Prosperity Now to conduct some research into some of the best programs and what's what's going on in these LMI communities that uh, needs to be overcome and to to increase this home ownership gap or to increase home ownership and reduce the gap. And one of the big things we found was that there's just a overwhelming need for CDFIs and non-bank CDFIs in particular and other community development entities, whether they're CDCs or faith-based organizations uh, to participate in in the solution, uh, the the opportunities for uh, depositories are great, but when it gets to these low to moderate income communities, especially communities of color, you end up having a gap between the relationships with um, potential homeowners and and the banking system. I think the FDIC had a recent study that said that the second largest cause of underbanked is uh, a lack of trust with some of the larger banks, um, which probably comes from uh, long tenured historical issues. Um, but to bridge that trust and to bring people into banking and also into home ownership, uh, often it takes uh, CDFIs and community-based organizations who are lenders 
And that's really creating a challenge in the current environment and a challenge that needs to be addressed and overcome uh, in, in two ways. One, um, uh, there have been a lot of programs, a lot of energy on how to increase uh, home ownership and how to reduce the wealth gap uh, through the banking system. But even as recently as a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. Treasury introduced uh, very positive new legislation to uh, increase funding into CDFIs, but only CDFIs that were depositories. Um, and so most of the energy has been focused on uh, the CDFIs and community-based organizations and MDIs that are depository institutions, which I think is a very positive and welcome approach, but it may not be um, sufficient uh, while it is necessary. Um, but non-bank CDFIs uh, have deep, long-standing relationships, are often affiliated with groups and organizations with deep relationships within these communities, and are often the ones that um, um, the underbank go to for advice, or the ones that the underbank trust. And so what, what the Prosperity Now study left me with was, was two things. One, we have a capital formation issue. And the capital formation isn't just uh, within the banking system, it's also for minority institutions and CDFIs outside the banking system. And oftentimes uh, that leads to number two, which is partnership. Uh, the most successful programs to address low to moderate income home ownership um, across the country over the last couple decades have been programs launched in partnership with CDFIs and community organizations. Um, and it tends to be partnerships that um, cross over between depository institutions and non-depository institutions. And they've been very constructive and they take the best uh, controls and operations and capital and knowledge from the depository system. And they pair it with the best relationships and trust and local knowledge and local understanding uh, the CDFI, non-bank CDFIs uh, often have. And so one of the missing uh, pieces that we've been focused on is to help the industry, the thousand plus industry of CDFIs, especially those that aren't depository institutions, <coughs> help uh, come up uh, the curve and increase their ability to partner uh, and in particular to partner for capital formation. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of banking institutions historically haven't um, found ways to do meaningful partnerships for capital formation. I think one of the, one of the case studies uh, that Prosperity Now pointed to was One West where One West formed partnerships with the National Housing Organization, CDFI, um, to help get greater home ownership in communities uh, of color and, com and minority communities. And it's pointed to as a signal of success where despite resources and a great team and leadership at One West, you know, bringing the non-bank CDFI and expertise in uh, housing along is, is really important. Um, I'd say that for capital formation, it's equally important. You know, we've started to have real progress, and I think some of the recent CRA uh, initiatives have created more focus and progress on uh, allowing banks to partner with non-bank CDFIs in order to deploy capital and to finance them. There have been meaningful capital raises over the last six months that are somewhat um, groundbreaking in the nine figure range where you see socially responsible investors start to realize that you can give money to those people for capital formation that aren't banks, but are CDFIs and can really push through and partnerships with banks where you can, where like uh, Chairman McWilliams was talking about FinTech partnerships with banks, uh, providing a technology reach, but when I think about the real reach that's necessary, it may be, it may be the relationship reach with some of these communities. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Dennis. I really appreciate uh, 
you providing us the time. Happy to answer any questions. And this is really important work that uh, that's being done here. Thank you, Steve. And uh, wow, uh, yeah. And you know, I, I I read that report, and I was uh, it was very very well done and and uh, quite comprehensive in terms of the the, the findings that are there and the identification of. Um, the larger ecosystem into which uh, solutions need to be integrated uh, was definitely a, a very good point that came out of it. And thank, thank you for uh, uh, being here today to explain that aspect of, of what's going on. Um, we're gonna turn next um, to what starts off or on the title anyway is a supplier diversity and technical assistance because that's what Sal Enriquez's um, job title is over at uh, Wells Fargo. And, but um, I want to ask you first, Sal, you know, uh, for a perspective before going into what's happening with uh, supplier diversity, small business, as, as, uh, as it affects uh, the work happening at Project Reach, but an economic forecast, you know, like, and, and particularly economic forecast for, for where small business is, is headed, uh, because we had a very good conversation about it the other day, and I think it's very well worth uh, sharing. So I turn the floor over to you for okay. the next 10 and uh, please uh, elucidate and educate <laughs> us. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Thank you to Faith for making it happen. Um, we are looking uh, now at uh, what will the post-corona scenario will look like. And, 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 and the good news is that we shall overcome uh, this, all the things that are happening uh, around the economic downturn because of the COVID-19 pandemic and are expecting a strong end of year. Uh, some of the forecasts that we've seen are uh, above 5% uh, and 2022 is also looking very good. When you're now talking about uh, uh, small businesses, you're seeing that uh, the pandemic really hurt small businesses. Uh, we have numbers where, you know, uh, the SBA reports that one in five small businesses uh, have uh, closed uh, their doors permanently. When you're looking at the numbers uh, that Yelp re is reporting on how many uh, restaurants have been closed, uh, you see that it's a significant number. So uh, within the arena of supplier diversity, as you know, we have as a goal to go and help diverse home companies take advantage of the opportunities that exist in companies like Wells Fargo, uh, an important pillar within supplier diversity is capacity building. So you have obviously the commitment that corporations like Wells Fargo have of spending X amount of dollars with diverse suppliers. I'm happy to report that we uh, uh, spend more than a billion dollars a year. We're closing 2020 with the number of $1.4 billion or close to 12% of our total spend, controllable spend with diverse suppliers. This includes uh, minority-owned companies, women-owned companies, LGBT, uh, people with disability, as well as veteran, and those with, that are uh, in the hub zones, the small businesses. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, within the capacity building programs that we have in place, and I'm happy to report, I'll share some numbers uh, 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 right now, uh, is that uh, we are preparing to make sure that small businesses are able to retool, recover, and restore from the uh, COVID pandemic. So uh, out of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, the profits, and this is very public, uh, our leadership has spoken about it, that uh, Wells Fargo made the decision to return those profits that we made from the Paycheck Protection Program back into the community. More than $200 million were assigned to CDFIs, specifically to support the CDFIs. Then we have $50 million uh, dedicated to technical assistance. These are grants that are going to be announced uh, in the second quarter of, uh, uh, of this year. Uh, where organizations are going to be awarded in, it, because they submitted proposals at the end of 2020 and said, we have ideas of how we can actually help uh, 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 the small diverse home company recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then uh, uh, we have an additional $100 million. This is, again, uh, out of the $400 million profits that are going to be uh, 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 focused on uh, helping restore uh, uh, um, uh, small and diverse home companies uh, take advantage of what is coming down in the economic uh, 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 outlook of 2021, second half, as well as 2022. So we have uh, th this opportunity. What, what have we also seen, uh, Dennis, that those companies that uh, had a uh, social media presence, that had an online presence and were able to uh, sell their products and services online fared better. So now when we're looking at you know, the capacity 
the capacity building programs that we sponsor. So I'm responsible for 10 capacity building programs uh, where we try to touch all the colors of the rainbow, making sure that we're assisting Asian American owned companies. Again, I open a parenthesis by saying that we stand in solidarity, solidarity, solidarity with the Asian American community. I'm happy to report here that uh, I'm part of the ELT leadership of the uh, uh, Latin Connection. So the, this is, these are the individuals that uh, represent the, the Hispanics that are working within Wells Fargo. And we've joined hand in hand with our brethren within the Asian American community to show our solidarity with everything that we're seeing and, 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 and speaking against the violence and saying this has to stop. And, and it has been elevated that uh, our CEO has actually spoken about it. So it is something that is very pre present for me. Uh, in, in the arena that I move in, I'm trying to promote economic empowerment through entrepreneurship. We're teaching entrepreneurship. We're teaching uh, small and diverse owned companies how to do business with a corporation like Wells Fargo. So we have 10 capacity building programs. These uh, capacity building programs have uh, the, um, the, the characteristic that we've done the research and saying, you know, less than 3% of diverse owned companies reach the $1 million mark. And so what has what have, have these companies, you know, done so successful that they reach what we call scalable, that 3%. And it has to do that, then we have to look at the barriers that are preventing small and diverse owned companies from reaching that point. And it's access to capital, access to contract and networking. In 2020, obviously networking was a little bit more difficult because we were not able to be in, this, be in these big engagements and meet uh, additional suppliers that we can invite and to be part of the supply chain at Wells Fargo. So we also have the access to capital. We've done the research. And so I'm happy to report, for example, in Paycheck Protection Program, we saw that not a lot of diverse owned companies were able to take advantage of this particular program. And so, however, the companies that are in capacity building programs at Wells Fargo or similar were able to secure their loan at the tune of almost 80% of those companies that were in there. So we have obviously, uh, we've done the research and saying, why aren't uh, diverse owned companies taking advantage? And so what we've done uh, is work hand in hand uh, with um, uh, experts and saying, what can we be teaching uh, within our capacity building programs so that they get comfortable? I can speak, for example, within the Hispanic community when we were teaching these courses and saying, here we have a loan that if you use uh, for, uh, um, uh, for uh, 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 on making sure that you make payroll, uh, you, it becomes a grant. Many companies were like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I, I, that. That seems very fishy to me. So we had to go and educate them. This is in order for you not to close your doors and that for you not to let go of people that are currently working with you. So we wanted to make sure that that uh, that was actually taking place. Another thing that was really important with the Paycheck Protection is that if you had a relationship with a banker, you were more comfortable going into a bank and applying for that loan. So we were pushing in the trainings that we were doing that they were getting comfortable. You didn't have to go and get a loan uh, at Wells Fargo through, uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program, but we wanted for you as a small business to take advantage of it. Now, why is this important? At the end of the day, we're in the business of actually uh, lending money. So successful small business owners are the success of Wells Fargo. We're one of the leading banks when it comes to lending small businesses. So we want healthy small businesses. So this is why we're investing so much money. I'm happy to report that uh, for the uh, profits of the Paycheck Protection Program 2.0, which is currently ongoing, those are also going to be given back to the community because again, we're very interested in making sure that we have strong, small and diverse owned companies. So, because at the end of the day, it's these companies that are full of innovation that we at Wells Fargo working with these companies makes us a better company. I'm, 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 I would not uh, 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 be myself if I don't point out, look at the, the innovation that, came, that comes out of a diverse owned company through a uh, called Zoom. Zoom is a company that came out of a, the mind of an American individual. And so, you know, if you're looking at all the great things that helped us go through uh, the pandemic, Zoom was an important one. And, 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 and the art that is coming out, when you're looking at the Oscar nominations, that when we we're all out in the doldrums, we we're looking at as much diverse opportunities out there. That's the way I see it, by the way, the importance of diverse owned companies that they bring into the American economy. We do know for a fact that the, uh, the, the diverse owned company will play a, 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 a very important role, a critical role in the economic recovery of the United States post Corona. So um, this is, I'm sorry that I, I could go on and on and on, but I, I went a little bit longer than I should. So I apologize. But as you can see, I'm very passionate of the work that I do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Saul. Um, you know, you uh, 
uh, you, you have you have lived up to the moniker that was first uh, given to me to describe uh, Wells Fargo the first time I, I, mm -hmm. I visited and had a, a, a meeting with uh, people from, from your institution. Mm -hmm. And they were very proud and they said, you know, really, we're the, lar the world's largest community bank. <laughs> and, um, and, and that these kinds of programs are, you know, right down the line of, of mm -hmm. that kind of innovation. And, and mm -hmm. so thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. And um, I'm going to move on in the interest of time um, and uh, move over. <clears throat> the, the next uh, area that, that we will expand a little bit more uh, coverage on is the, the revitalization of minority deposit institutions. Uh, and because uh, it's a, a very, these are, these are, about as community bank as it gets in, in this country in terms of right down to the core of targeting the most vulnerable communities. <coughs> and <coughs> so I'm gonna ask uh, Simon Pang, who's with um, uh, uh, Royal Bank um, to please, I mean, you know, start by describing, you know, what is the role of an MDI in the, in the banking and finance landscape? Uh, what do they need to thrive? Uh, what's happening to to help revitalize them? What kind of technical assistance uh, are is the larger community bringing uh, to that? <clears throat> you know, and and particularly given in the context of you know, it's uh, uh, Steve Sugarman earlier pointed out the need for uh, the the uh, the integration of the non banking world uh, into the solution making process, but then there's the specialist banking world, which, uh, MDIs are a part of, and how does that work as well? So, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you for about 10 and, um, uh, please, um, you know, educate us all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dennis. What I want to say or oh, comment, um, um, Faith and, uh, the chairman McWilliams already took at least 90% cover 90% of which already. So, um, but anyway, um, you know, MDI is um, um, uh, which, by definition, minority deposit institution. It has to be fifty-one percent or more of the, the voting stock is owned by uh, minority individuals, or number two, a majority of the board of directors is minority, and the community that. Uh, the institution serve is a uh, prominently minority. Ownership must be U.S. citizens or permanent legal U.S. resident to be counted in determining minority ownership. Uh, I mean, just an uh, information that uh, you know, um, everyone can just go to the FDIC uh, website. You can find out that um, um, as a MDI bank, we have been an MDI bank since uh, the formation of the bank in uh, 2008, and we have been actively participate uh, in terms of get access directly uh, to the technical support. Uh, as an example, um, uh, many a times when we want to introduce uh, a product uh, or whatsoever, we always uh, uh, call MDI or um, uh, write um, uh, email to the MDI uh, coordinator in um, uh, in our region to seek uh, for advice and they are very responsive uh, they always come back uh, tell us um, you know what to do and uh, of course before um, you know they come in or they they communicate with us we have to make sure that we have uh, the whole night yard of thing that are we doing as an example about six um, seven years ago when we first implement our residential mortgage uh, um, uh, area that uh, we spent, we invested uh, uh, both uh, human hour and also uh, to kind of for almost two years to make sure that we're on the right track on numerous area, you know, the compliances, uh, I mean, the whole nine yards, you know, uh, for the regulations. So finally, we, uh, we launched the product, you know, um, uh, after the two years uh, uh, investment in time and also money. Um, we are, we're doing uh, well in that area. And um, as an MDI bank, um, every year, I think twice in a year, uh, we get invited uh, to attend the annual uh, so-called workshop. Uh, I encourage everybody to uh, go there. 
to attend the workshop to find out what's the latest. They, uh, the regulators are always updating all the banks on what they are doing. And um, uh, it is a good um, uh, access, uh, direct uh, access uh, for minority bank. And uh, we really appreciate that um, FDIC and also OCC and Federal Reserve Bank uh, collectively uh, put this program work, you know, in perspective and very, very helpful for us as an MDI bank. You know, over here, uh, you know, sell is from uh, Wells Fargo Bank, you know, uh, by virtue of the big size bank, you in you know, if you make deposit um, with us, then you qualify for CRA as well because we are FDI bank. This is you know part of the business solicitation uh, for you huh? <laughs> from yourself. But anyway, not necessary uh, to a financial institution. Also for big corporation like uh, Charter Communication, AT and T you know, uh, T-Mobile, you name it, the whole nine are, you know. Um, collectively, our bank, um, we always emphasize on, on MDI assistance, you know, and we have been very active uh, together working with the NDI and also with, uh, with people like uh, Steve Sugarman. Uh, we have to go for the whole nine yard, you know, to make, thing that, make sure that we pro, uh, have to meet the community um, in the different kind of area in terms of uh, homeowner uh, ownership, you know, and also that uh, we have been very active in terms of our PPP loan as well. And uh, we're going to launch a small business loan uh, uh, starting from next uh, next month uh, so that we want to make sure that all the small businesses in California that uh, we've uh, been our uh, service area are fully met. And also we, um, we, we are always on an ongoing basis, what I'm trying to say, as an MDI bank. Uh, Dennis. Uh. All, right. All right. Well, thank you, Simon. And uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very clearly, there's, um, th there actually is a lot going on in, in terms of uh, getting, uh, particularly with all of the changes that are occurring in the banking industry, just the, the need for adaptation and, and the stuff that I'm seeing happening in the, in these committees about finding ways to adapt and and you know we heard chairman mcwilliams earlier about you know uh, adaptation um i know that uh when brian brooks was at the uh occ you know that was a big emphasis you know they they they, they also have uh, uh an innovation uh, di uh, directorate that they were starting up at the same time along with the fdic and you know bringing in fintech and there's just a lot of stuff to to look at and very clearly from from an MDI perspective, that's a lot of technology and a lot of things to absorb with a much more limited staff than you know the the uh, the uh, large army of people that the, that Sal has uh, you know to, to go attack problems. But thank you very much for um, for that. Um, so I have some questions that were that were asked. Uh, one in particular, and then but uh, and then there's a priority question because. Uh, wait for it, boys. Uh, Miss Faith wants to ask a question. So, you know, prep, prep your thinking caps because you know how, how that goes. Um, uh, so let's, um, and, and the question was, you can address it as, as it comes along, but the, uh, there is a, an, an anonymous question having to do with, you know, it's the what's in it for me question, which is, which after the COVID pandemic ends, which industry sectors do you think will bounce back fastest, and which ones do you think will never be the same? Which is a uh, it's a very broad and general question, um, but I'm going to let that stew in your heads for a minute because the bell of the ball wishes to ask a question. Miss Faith, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the, the the four of them. Number one, I'm going to ask Steve. Uh, you change your company um, into change. And I think it's a kind of be a perfect timing, right? If you can discuss what should be the change, what have you seen? You know, we, we work with you for a long time. What are what are the changes should happen? And then now I'll go to you first. Well, we've been we've been trying to measure um how you think about the impact and, and change so i think that um 
What I'd say is you could bring it down to some pretty simple metrics. I think that the average black family who owns a home in America, uh, according to research, pays about $67,000 more during the life of their mortgage than a white family with uh, the same mortgage. Um, you know, change is making it so that number is zero. Um, the, there should be equal access to credit um, in communities and in populations across the country. At our company, uh, we were pretty proud that last year we lent about $7 billion to homeowners, but our black homeowners who borrowed from us on average um, saw rates that were 13 basis points cheaper than average. And they saw LTV is about 10% higher. And and just coming up to about 80% LTVs. And I think that what we're trying to uh, raise awareness of is that um, credit quality doesn't track community or ethnicity. And you can get to the same cost of a mortgage, the same access to a mortgage, and the same terms on a mortgage if you look at it by credit quality. And the, there's a lot there's a lot where that's not quite the case quite yet. So that's that's what needs to change. Thank you. And thank you. I just want to acknowledge Steve Sugarman, you know, who's been very influential um, in helping form NBC uh, when Bob Guinness uh, retired. And fortunately, he, he passed away. Steve have helped um, NBC. So I just want to publicly say that. Um, I have a question with the regulator and 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 uh, Bill and and Sal and and you know um, Simon. I mean, this is your thing. Asian hate, right? Um, we've been advocating for this. This is who I am from from day one, uh, twenty years ago. Uh, what should be done to help Asian homeowners? There's a myth that Asian is successful, they own homes, they own businesses. But you can see we are still invisible community. Uh, CDFI doesn't consider Asian as minority. Um, can you please, in light of what's happening, what is OCC um, regulator is doing and helping uh, empower the Asian community? Um, and so, um, how do Wells Fargo help Asian and not being lumped as all together as Asian? We all know that, um, you know, so many sub-ethnic groups, right? We all speak different languages and, and this is what's, what's happening. You know, they just don't understand the culture of Asian and NDC is about solution. I, I'd like you to talk about that also, please. And then also, for Simon, um, uh, being an, an Asian uh, banker, if you can just give some of your comments, how we can serve more of the Southeast Asia. Thank you. And I'm gonna give it up to you there this afternoon. So, <clears throat> Faith, 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 thank you. And Dennis, you gave us you gave us fair warning. This would be uh, this would be a, this would be a great question. So. You know, Faith, absolutely. You know, I, I made reference to the to, to the most recent set of, of, of tragic events, and sadly, you know, we can we can go back and and, and point to, to, to many others as well. But you know, so as, as an agency, I, I echo the same comments that that Elena made earlier uh, through, through that, that that riveting uh, discussion uh, around the, the focus on, on on diversity and inclusion. Uh, every, every time one of these tragic events happens, there's messages and reminders about our our, our values as, as humans and our values as, as regulators uh, about uh, about the, the the senseless acts of of, of hatred and, and violence, and that we that we uh, abhor and you know and you know, um, 
it, it just makes me makes me sad at a personal level too to think that these things still st still happen. Uh, so, so so we are doing you know everything we can to to focus on the the diversity and inclusion initiatives. We of course have have an office of diversity and inclusion as well, and expectations for you know institutions uh, to, to to abide by those those same types of of, of goals and objectives. Um, you know, uh, through through Project Reach, uh, reaching back to this again, Faith. So you've heard some of the conversations. You know, through some of the meetings that that through the 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 acts that really prompted uh, Project Reach to to begin with back last spring and summer, that several people came to the table with the idea that they were only interested in focusing on one particular sector of of minority populations for 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 capital investment, for resources, et cetera, and I can't remember how many times that we've we've reminded people that this is not about a one particular segment of society. That this is about everybody who's been underrepresented and and not given equal chances um, at, at 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 a fair shake over time. And making sure that that what we're doing through this is is fully inclusive and and not just focused on on one of many segments of society that have. That have been underrepresented, and we will continue to do that um, through the course of this project. I'll 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 try to answer it and and give it. Uh, I'm an economist by training, so I'll give it the economic spin, and say that each time that there's been an economic downturn, these great companies are formed. And if something that can characterize the Asian American community is the innovation that is coming out of the community. So imagine you had these people that have been stuck for 12 months at their homes like everyone else, but they their juices are flowing and what great ideas are actually going to be coming out of it. What are the great companies that are going to be being formed in the coming months and years? And so when you're talking about how are we as a bank trying to support the Asian American entrepreneurs by developing programs that are specifically created for the needs of the Asian American community. And this is very important when you say, we're not all just Asian, there's all these breakdowns. The needs of, for example, a Chinese American are very different from a Japanese American. And so try and understand those nuances so that when you create a program, you're able to address, it could be soft negotiation skills, or it could be about learning to be a better negotiator, by the way, when you're creating that, or uh, how do you uh, as a banker support the innovation and the new technologies that are coming out. Look at uh, all the uh, 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 companies that have been formed in Silicon Valley and you see that around 50% uh, uh, we are told are uh, formed by immigrants, by the way. And a lot of these happen to be Asian immigrants. I could I, I, I could think of Yahoo, for example, that, you know, that, that was one of them, you know, or I, or, I, or I can think of another one. And so what we're trying to do within our capacity building programs is providing the information and saying, when you're launching a business, these are the barriers that you're going to encounter and this is how you overcome those barriers. So this is why we partner with as many organizations as possible because sometimes you know, it, 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 uh, we will go in and, and do the consultation because we may have an idea and say, we have a program specifically, let's say for Filipino Americans and then you faith will come back and say, that's great. But what we actually need is X, Y, and Z. Can the programs that we're going to be a uh, 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 sponsoring address those uh, uh, issues? And I think it, it is by having these type of consultations that we can be uh, 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 supportive of the community. At the end of the day, as I said, I'm into economic empowerment through entrepreneurship. It is through you having this big voice as an entrepreneur that you're able to address a lot of the discrepancies that we've been talking about. And so, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm very uh, 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 hopeful and, 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 and full of excitement because I believe that we're about to encounter some great opportunities. It could be through telemedicine or it could be through the marriage of artificial intelligence and new technologies. And guess who's going to be at the, at the spearhead of that? It's going to be the Asian American community. And so we need to be there and support them and make sure that those dreams are actually coming to realization. Look at all the companies that were now currently in the Fortune 500 companies that did not exist 20 years ago. Now think of it. 
what are the what are the new companies that are going to be concocted in 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 in, 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 a, in a table uh, 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 in a dining room table of a, 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 a let's say about a Korean American or a Japanese American? This is this is great, and this is why this is the secret sauce of what makes America so great that we're able to take advantage of the best and make sure that we support them. And so, what can we do as a bank support uh, entrepreneurs to realize that dream? By the way, so there, there there's there's good there's good things coming around the corner. I promise you, Faith. <laughs> Keep the faith, faith. <laughs> Simon, um, for us uh, at um, the uh, Royal Business Bank, um, every month during the board meeting, we always um, the board members always ask for statistic. So, what area that we do? Low income, moderate income, you know, whatever you know, in different category, and. The fortunately of un, unfortunately we have presence in Southern California. Uh, you know, you're talking about Orange County, uh, uh, LA County, and also Ventura County, and also we are in the Clark County in the state of Nevada, in Illinois, uh, in New York. We have it now. We also have New Jersey, so we have to make sure that collectively on the on a monthly basis we have meeting with all the managers and all the lending officers. So we want to make sure that we meet those categories. This is number one. It's the ongoing board uh, emphasis on this area. There's no doubt that. Um, secondly, I know we have um, our um, uh, CBF advisory board, uh, which give us the guidance and advice. Uh, we work with uh, numerous entities so that uh, also uh, get together and to promote the home ownership and also the small business loan uh, to the community and for the underserved uh, uh, community. This is what we are doing. You know, uh, I, I can add more to that, but you know, as a bank, we spend almost like almost 3,000 human hour in terms of uh, community service, you know, participating in community service. Um, to kind of educate uh, for uh, the community in terms of uh, home application. And uh, because of the tax season, we also uh, spend a lot of time uh, and also a human hour to allocate our staff member to help the uh, uh, numerous uh, entity for uh, filing a tax return. Uh, that's what we have been doing, you know. I mean, of course, we are open for a new area of avenue that we can further enhance and do better. So that is why that uh, you know uh, we work very closely with uh, NDC uh, and also some other uh, uh, you know uh, um, community um, leader on on this particular in this area. Okay. Thank you. Well. Um... So we're, we're 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 out of time, and uh, and I, I've been I've been a very good boy in in and acting as a moderator to uh, you know not inject myself <laughs> too deeply into anything, but I'm going to close uh, with a thought on on this, and and because uh, you know this is this is essentially the module uh, that talks about Project Reach, which is the, which is the OCC thing, and I and. In, in terms of fairness. I mean, um, you know, I'm Filipino, but I'm very fortunate to uh, have really never felt a day of, of being a second-class citizen in the United States. I've, I've been very fortunate in that. And uh, so I have that, I have that perspective of, of having been accepted. And, and I got here on an airplane and, and we brought our dishes with us uh, as, as check luggage uh, when we got here. So you know, I, I know where it comes from, but so here's the thought, and this is the OCC capstone for this. On his very last day in office, before leaving the OCC, acting comptroller of the currency, Brian Brooks, signed the Fair Access to Financial Services final rule that basically made it mandatory for banks to, to, to be fair in how they provided services to all of their customers, be it consumer, be it business, be it anything else. That final rule was, it has not been published. It is sitting there waiting 
for the next comptroller of the currency to review it before releasing it into the uh, the rulemaking space, the regulatory space of the banking system. And um, as we sit here today and we look at growing inequities that have not gone away, it is not lost on me that we have not put that final rule into place to begin to remedy some of the flaws that we have built in our society. And that in the end is probably as I listen to people uh, expressing their fears and consternations about what is still happening to our, to our country as a society. Um, that's kind of the stuff that bothers me. We have the infrastructural solutions. We know what to do. And we still haven't gotten to the point that we've been brave enough to act. And um, with that, uh, I want to thank everybody. You have brought so much information to this discussion today and, 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 and created so many things. But uh, and I see Simon has one last thing to say. Go ahead, go ahead, my friend. You asked just now, Dennis, which industry will come back so fast, right, after the pandemic? Yeah. My prediction is aeroplane, airline. Yes, uh, I, I I can already see that. I can already see their 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 rates going up. My my, uh, my small my my small business industry vote is for uh, restaurants that survived, that uh, they uh, want they are going to thrive in uh, as things come back because they have they've learned to survive both virtually and brick and mortar. And um, you know I think they're going to be stronger. I, I I don't know so about some of the retail world, but yeah. Anyway. Um, we're out of time. Uh, we're about five minutes over on, on the clock and I'm sure everybody is hungry, but I, I want to thank everybody again. This was a wonderful panel and, um, uh, and, and let's do it again sometime. And hopefully the next time we can all look back and go like, geez, all the stuff that we tried to put into place, it really did make the world better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for facilitating. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Simon. Um, we're going to, um, go and break. Um, I have a lot of Filipino food here. I wish you can come and uh, uh, <laughs> Filipino food, but uh, Adobo, lumpias, or what? <laughs> everything is too bad, uh, but uh, hopefully next year we're going to be in, in person. So enjoy uh, it. We'll be right back. This is going to be a great conversation uh, between um, Brian Brooks and director of College of A, Mark Calabria. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.